There are no mistakes in life, only happy little accidents. And by accidents, I mean putting a kitchen knife in your best friend's gut. I'm here with the creative minds of the behind of the art of killing, not the joy of painting, the art of killing. And this is Slash Sports Cinema. And I'm here to kill you. I am Dracula. Say that I have shed innocent blood. What's blood for if not for shame? Six year old child with this blank, pale, emotionless face. The blackest eyes. I like to dissect girls. Did you know I'm utterly insane? Jacob Ennis, Gregory Brock, welcome. Thank you. How's it going? Glad to be on here. You know, guys, I was all of today years old, as the cool kids say, when I learned that Andy Serkis did the motion capture for King Kong, the Peter Jackson flick. Never knew. Wow. Never knew. <laughs> yeah, a a Andy fucking Serkis. He the, does everything. Uh, Go Gollum himself <laughs> also did the mocap for King Kong. I mean, I, I guess what this film feels like, I don't know, 15 years old, 20. I Time flies. It does. Time flies. It feels like 15 years. But did what you guys already know that? <laughs> it could have been. I mean, did you guys already know that about Andy Serkis? I, I didn't. I didn't no. Yeah. I, I saw that film in, in theaters um, when it was, you know, brand new and it's probably a yearly watch for me. So I'm a little upset that I, I would learn something like that today because I pride myself on knowing these little bits of trivia. And uh, yeah, that one threw me for a loop. Yeah. Um, speaking of cinemas guys, have you guys heard the uh, read this news about Regal cinemas shutting down? Uh, I have. Uh, why? Horrible. I mean, exactly. is, is the theater business really suffering that much? I think, yeah, streaming's really hurt it a lot, I think. I mean, but this has been for, you know, years now. Regal, yeah. at, at least where I am in Tennessee, you guys are up in Kentucky, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Good luck in Kentucky. So we're not too far away from each other. I think the majority of these theaters that are closing down, I, I read the list. I didn't, I just kind of scanned it for, you know, the local one. Right, making sure, was, making sure I was, my membership was still to be intact, but I think the majority of them over in California uh, could yeah. be wrong about that. But I saw a lot of California cities that are losing their theaters. Yeah, I didn't see um, Kentucky on there either. No, nah, no, nah, but like a bankruptcy, you, you 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 start to think, you know, about the numbers and like we've been complaining about the movie theater prices for years, decades, and you think how does a business like that go under if i'm paying six dollars for a bucket of popcorn yeah like, right. uh, that probably made you know took 50 cents to <laughs> to make <laughs> how does the how do theaters go out of business like that especially the the top are the are is regal still the top chain of of cinemas i think it is uh yeah. pretty sure yeah or uh, at least i know amc was having trouble too though we're, yeah, that. man, it's you wild. But I mean, strong, you know, like with coming like post COVID and like everybody wanting to get out, you know, like I guess it, it felt like, like there was a theater surge, man. Yeah, After the like, pandemic was sort of over, it felt I like there was a like, surge to get back into the theaters. You know, yeah, like the damage is already done or whatnot. I guess, but I guess, kind of I sad, guess. Man. I mean, big films, you know, that were dropping like, um, well, Halloween Kills comes to mind. Um, it was in theaters, but it, it also streamed for free on, on, mm -hmm. on Peacock, right? Yeah. And there was a thought that a Halloween Ends was not going to follow the same. They didn't actually announce the, the release on Peacock until 
like way later into you know the the I guess the, the marketing of it. Um, it. It hadn't been announced by anybody, and then maybe a month before it's set to release. They say they're going to drop it on Peacock and, you know, we're going to repeat the same, I guess, process that Kills did. And I just wonder, like, why do we do that? Peacock and the streaming services must be paying top dollar to these films. I mean, you guys know more about streaming rights than anybody I know, because I know some of your films are kind of in limbo on on who's going to get to stream it. So, I mean, yep. what kind of insight can you give on, on I guess, how the streaming s- situation works? Yeah, a lot of the big distribution companies own, like, Peacock. And uh, so it, it's basically like putting it on their own platform. So they're keeping all the proceeds r- rather than giving it over to the cinemas. And and the, uh, that, at least that's what I think it really goes into. But, yeah, I mean, like, streaming's like, I mean, it's all different, obviously, from different platforms. It varies, like, a great deal, you know, as far as what you make. Uh, right now, in my opinion, like, Tubi's where it's at. I mean, Tubi's hot. I think everybody loves Tubi's. And you can't beat free. I mean, it pays better out for the filmmaker. It's a pretty sweet deal, actually. I've heard that, that Tubi was really strong on their ad revenue for uh, the creators. It's way better than Amazon. I'll tell you that. It's way better than Amazon. Wait a minute. You're going to sit there and tell me with a straight face. <laughs> I'm not even going to finish that phrase. <laughs> okay. I, I, I believe you. Anything Amazon related, I've, I've got no doubts that they're not paying the, the fair share to any creators. I mean, uh, Jeff Bezos has got his hands in this somewhere. Yeah. And yeah. So i tell yeah, you what, I, I don't know how you guys feel about um, American football, as some of my friends might call it. Um, it. <laughs> well, you know, if, if um, <laughs> hey, you know what? That is your local guys, right? I mean, yeah. you guys are northern Kentucky, so that's that's got to be your closest team. Um, I don't know my geography of, of Ohio very well, but you're substantially further from Cleveland than you are Cincinnati. Yeah. Where yeah. are you in Kentucky? We're about central Kentucky. Okay, so maybe an hour south of Louisville? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, yeah, you're going to be either in in Bengals country or maybe even, well, you don't have the Rams anymore that you can even (laughs) fall on because they didn't move way out west. But Jeff Bezos has been rumored. Okay, so that's my hometown team, but I'm not a Titans fan. Back when I started watching football – the Tennessee Titans were called the Houston Oilers. So mm-hmm. I got no love for those guys, <laughs> but I'm a, a Washington commanders fan. Oh, okay. And yeah. That, that, I mean, that comes with its own set of problems, but um, you know, there've been rumors that Jeff Bezos was a possible um, purchaser oh, wow. of, of my squad. And I don't know how to feel about <laughs> that. It's like, do I support the devil or do I you know, just <laughs> let the, the the colors run deep? I, I don't know. I'm 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 balancing on that, but I, I think I'm gonna have to stick with them, no matter if they have an evil owner or not. But uh, you know, on on the subject of cinemas, guys, uh, you got any films that you're looking forward to in the next little while? Terrifier three, most definitely. I mean, that's what I'm most excited for. How far down the pipe is that? I would say it's about a year and a half, two years out. I would say, yeah, I'd say. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, so, one and two, fantastic. I actually didn't get to see All Hallows until mm. after I'd seen Terrifier two, and it was kind of good to to go back and see the origin mm-hmm. of you know the the villainous character. That yeah, I, yeah it's I a guess you could. Film. Yeah, and and you know. It feels like with the cult following, I don't even know if you can call it a cult following because this thing was made with what, 20 grand, 200 grand? I can't remember the the exact number. Somewhere around that, I think. It was something stupid that, stupidly low for them to gross stupidly high, you know, such a high percentage. And that's just, that's exactly what you're in it for. 
you know, it's not what you're in it for. If you're in it for the love of filmmaking, yeah. but you, you kind of do hope you strike gold with something like that. Oh, of course. Yeah. And Everybody's that, looking for that character, you know, like, I mean, Art the Clown, which is now an icon. That's like any filmmaker's dream is, you know, to come up with an icon, an iconic character like that, you know? And not only that, but he just completely took off organically. Nobody was forcing him on anybody. Nobody's trying to upsell him. He just did his thing on screen and now everybody fucking loves him. Yeah. And you, ha you got to respect that. You got, you really have to respect that. Uh, Damien Leon just fucking ripped it. And I mean, we're going to, we're going to talk about the, uh, the, the man behind the sound of terrifier two here in just a little bit, but you've got wins on all fronts in uh, terrifier two. You've got um, a, a final girl who's really taken off. Maybe not so much in, in the first one, not really that memorable, but uh, Lauren Lavera's really taken off in the public eye as well. Yeah, um, very outspoken on the social medias, um, you know, which which is her God given right. She's a fantastic gal, fantastic actress for being just a stunt, uh, just a stunt lady. You know, she she didn't come from, you know, she didn't go to Juilliard. You know, she didn't go to uh, the the New York uh, Performance Arts Academy. So uh, she's pretty pretty raw. And she really, I guess, I you know, it helps people identify with her because she felt real. So, I mean, hats off to the guys who made that film. But, you know, you guys pretty much keep up with film 40, as much she's as... She's not 45 years old either. <laughs> yeah, not yeah, different different thing altogether. Um, th that's kind of been the running joke. And I think sometimes yeah. even she misses the joke. You, you'll you'll get somebody uh, to say, well, you, I mean, you did great for a forty-five-year-old gal, and <laughs> like, I don't even know who they're mixing her up with. Right? Is is there another Lauren Lavera or maybe a, a, a similar name, Lavero? I don't know. I have but, no idea how they got started, but I find it hilarious though. It's hilarious because I think even Google at one point said that she was forty-something years old. Yeah. Because yeah. because of the misnomer. <laughs> But I'll tell you what film I'm looking forward to, man. And it's A Knock at the Cabin. Oh, um, me too. Al yeah, already a big Shyamalan fan. Uh, but, you know, being a hillbilly from uh, northern middle Tennessee, you kind of, you know, Hispanic kids grew up on soccer. Um, you know, Midwest cities grew up on, I, I guess, the wrestling mat. Pro wrestling, if you're a hillbilly like me, then you fucking <laughs> loved pro wrestling growing up. And Damn both up. of you are nodding because you're both a couple of hillbillies like me. And yeah, I dig it. <laughs> so <clears throat> Dave Batista, man, like who's who saw this guy being a halfway decent actor? Yeah. I yeah. thought he was terrible on screen, like in <laughs> you know, in wrestling. I was like, he's just a body guy, big muscular, you know, meathead. But then he starts coming out in, in films, he's like, okay, the dude can halfway act. And watching the trailer of A Knock at the Cabin. Looks like, phenomenal. It yeah, does. Really it does. And not in spite of him. Partly because of him. Yeah. Right? I mean, he, he's, he's looking like he's going to do a great job on that. But the idea and the premise behind A Knock at the Cabin isn't brand new. See, you know, no. the apocalypse type of situation. You got a almost a home invasion type of situation. <clears throat> and... It, you know they're they're not reinventing the wheel, but it all seems to come together really well. And Dave Batista, I mean, hats off. But speaking of inspired, I'm inspired by what you guys are doing right now. And you must have known that a Bob Ross inspired horror film was long <laughs> past due. Who had this idea? Mr. Jacob Ennis over here. <laughs> Point him out. Tell tell me about it. I'm too damn mad. Well, I mean, it's just I've I've had this idea for a long time. Actually, I just it's always just to me thought it was absolutely freaking hilarious. Uh, you know, for that to happen, it, and I was researching. Really, there was nothing out there like that at all. And I was like, man, I was like, you know, with the popularity, especially with Bob Ross now, I was like just bigger than it's ever been he's just netflix shows netflix, and, just a huge yeah. icon man like everybody knows bob ross right so it's like you, I, I just couldn't believe that there was really nothing out there like 
I was like, so I just, it was the time to do it, man. I don't know. I, I'm still shocked that no one has done it. Yeah, yet, really. we were in the middle of writing another script, and we were both like, I'm not feeling this. And he's like, hey, you know, I have this idea for this Bob Ross type character, you know, and the, the paintings that he's making is where he's hiding the bodies type of thing. And that's kind of the premise we went off of. Um, and then we just took off with the script. And then we had the script's first draft in like four or five days. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, yeah. It, was, it just, when, once we got started, man, it just, it would just flowed out of us pretty much. Like we had it it's knocked out really fast and it's, it's been fun. Well, Jake, something that you just said, uh, the, the paintings are where he hides the bodies. I think I've seen a meme or something like that yeah. where like, it's like, what if, Right. It's like one of those stupid memes like um, what if soy milk is just speaking Spanish and introducing itself? But yeah, I've seen this where like what if <clears throat> excuse me, what if these paintings are where Bob Ross is hiding the body? And is and so that's kind of what inspired, I guess, the the little nugget of a thought that snowballed yeah. into into what we see or what we're gonna see very soon. Exactly. Yeah. And it's even expanded once we got riding, it kind of expanded even more because it's this little TV station that's at the center of it. Right. It's not just about him. Mm -hmm. There's these other characters, TV personalities within this, this universe also that, uh, you know, really come out in the movie too. So you have like WJGK, which is this super like low watt uh, TV station that's, you know, run down, uh, people that's been there, you know, some people, characters have been there for many, many years. They're burnt out, you know. It's just, it was such a perfect opportunity. And not only like that, to having it from a TV station in order to, like, introduce, like, um, faux TV shows and commercials and everything. It was just, like, the perfect opportunity. Yeah, and it, it takes place in the 80s, too. So, you know, it's a good time to, to be yeah. in this universe. So, Well, that's not unlike a uh, PBS type station right right i mean exactly right everybody that was on pbs had been on pbs for decades you know mr yeah, rogers definitely. the uh the jelly bean junction lady um right they, they were probably doing schoolhouse rock for 50 years <laughs> until right. they, they took it <laughs> off right so it's not that's unlike exactly that. that's exactly what like reading rainbow you know like captain kangaroo bozo like we have we have a children's show within this that plays like that's that's freaking pretty awesome, dude. Like, um, so we got to introduce his Drew name, Marvin, yeah, yeah. yeah, Drew. He, he was amazing in it. He plays Willie Wanker, and the name of the show is Willie Wanker's Big Time Fun Show. So yeah, it's uh, it's a lot of fun there, man. There's a lot to of ask about that character. Down. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot no. of jealousy between Willie Wanker, a guy that's been there for 20 years. You know, he's already had he's already had his stardom. Now he's on the he's low, you know, going down, and Leland's on the rise. So there's you know they have that conflict there, which is fun. Well, that that kind of draws your picture for the conflict between those two, right? So yeah, I mean, Drew Marvick, he's a uh, he's an interesting cat. He is love Drew. He, man. <clears throat> he's going to be coming up in a film very soon called. I don't know how they're pronouncing this. I think it's XXXmas, could be Triple yeah. Xmas, yeah. with uh, actually one of your co stars or a co star uh, in this film. But, you know, just uh, maybe a couple of days ago, uh, we declared that we were going to have ourselves a Bob Ross day where we basically give nothing but um, positive reinforcement and motivation. And we tried it on Friday. As soon as I walked in the office, they said, Billy, it's Bob Ross day. No snark <laughs> from you. No bullshit. Like it's Bob Ross day. That lasted until about lunchtime. And then it was back to, you know, the, the wheels falling off. Right. But, uh, but what is it about eighties inspired horror that makes us love it so much? I mean, we had stranger things with their series summer of 84, um, my good pal uh, Paul Ragsdale and Angie D'Alba with Murder Size. Oh, um, Adam Freeman doing a, a remake of Scream Dream. Uh -huh. And you know now we have a Bob Ross-inspired serial killer. And I have to yeah. say, man, I love the premise. Absolutely well, dude, love this premise. 85, 86 to me, in my opinion, is the greatest years in horror. You know, like, so just that whole time period, you know, being the age we are, you know, um, 
it's just a natural progression, I think. You know? And, it, you know, it's everywhere now. Um, you can go into Walmart now and still see 80s clothes. Right. Vinyls mm -hmm. out, you know, at Walmart. It's, you know, it's, it's crazy. And, you know, they're taking things that were once pure and turning it into horrific. I mean, you're, yeah. you're taking you guys with Bob Ross. What about Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey? Yeah. You well, know, um, not long ago, they did... Uh, uh, what, what's the cat's name that just got in the accident, jacked his legs up? Jeremy Renner, um, uh, the Hansel and Gretel uh, yeah. horror flick. Um, back in the 90s, you had Rumpelstiltskin, which mm -hmm. was, I mean, he was already kind of evil, but it was always a children's tale, and they turned into a straight-up horror flick. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, they took fucking Abraham Lincoln and made him a vampire <laughs> hunter. Come on, but things that were once pure are now being made evil. And I gotta say, I love it. Me too. I love yeah. it. And Bob Ross has been untouched for all this amount of time. Yep. And you guys did it. Mm -hmm. Yep. You guys had the balls to do <laughs> it. What is that one film that's coming out though? Like, I mean, this was after we started ours and everything, but The Grinch. No, the, the... Bob Ross inspired thing. Oh, oh yeah, it's a movie with uh Owen Wilson. Um, where he's Bob Ross. I don't think he's like a murderer. Yeah, psychopath. I think it's a comedy though. Okay, well that that's that that's keeping him silly. I mean, that's yeah. that's just Owen Wilson's shtick, right? Didn't he? Yeah. Wasn't he in the Starsky and Hutch situation? Yeah. Um, he was. And it, yeah, that just is kind of his thing. You can't take him seriously anymore. Right. He, wasn't he in Black Hawk Down or something? I think so. He was in one I, of those. Or behind yeah. enemy lines, or one of them. Behind enemy lines, yeah. For sure. I think was that it was that one? Yeah. 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 Like, how do you take old Dick Nose there and take him <laughs> seriously? <laughs> how do you take him seriously in a military film like Behind Enemy Lines? I, I don't. You know. can't. You can't. But yeah, tell you what though, um, unrelated, and I don't want to get off track here, but I did just see a film with him, and I. I'm, I shouldn't have even brought it up because I can't think of the name of it, but they're basically overseas in what looks like Thailand. Um, one of my favorite countries on earth. And he and his family basically are get caught in the middle of this. Um, it, it's, it's almost like, a, I don't even know what you would call it. It's just a, an all round attack because the company he works for is, I guess there to do damage that he he and his coworkers didn't realize. So they're targets of all these locals. Very yes. good film. If Was it No Escape? It, it is No Escape. Yes, that movie is excellent. You know what? I never give Owen Wilson any credit, even though. Yeah. I don't think I've ever seen a flick of his that I didn't think was at least decent for what it was trying to do. Yeah. I don't give him enough credit. Uh, my stepdad calls him Dick Nose. And that's why I have to call him Dick Nose. <laughs> He's forever Dick Nose now for me. Like, that's like... I hope so. If oh, if you don't God. take anything from this, <laughs> I hope that forever. our encounter, <laughs> I hope forever that our encounter makes Owen Wilson Dick Nose. <laughs> forever Dick Nose, forever. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. But, you know, I got to ask you, like, what's so 80s? about the art of killing like what have you done in the art of killing to bring the 80s to 2023 yeah we used um wardrobe was 80s hair hairstyles was 80s uh well the score the soundtrack is definitely 80s um it just i mean it just, uh, all, all around it just has eight which i'll never do another i don't think I'll ever do another period piece right no. off the bat like <laughs> It's it's horrible, man. It's the hardest thing I've ever tried to do. I don't think I'll ever do it again, honestly. You know, when when I think period piece, I think like Amadeus. <laughs> right. Know, yeah. Not not the decade I was born in. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and that's sad as shit. But guys, you know, I'm not gonna let everybody take your word for it. What do you say we just fucking show them? All right, yeah. Let's get this trailer yeah, going. Friends. TV like personality Leland Moss hosts Painting with Friends. Real VHS number two. Behind his sparkling personality are some very dark secrets. I want to talk about this guy in a bit. And when a family of devote fans wins a contest to meet their beloved icon, they may Dixie. get more than what they bargained for. They just may find that his first stroke 
will be their last. Mm. Love this. The art of killing. Guys, I absolutely love this. Absolutely love this. You know, in uh, the recent weeks, uh, I've spoken to you know various folks and you know stressed the importance of sound in horror. And I'm not only talking about you know sound effects, yeah, which you know I, which I believe are of the utmost importance to me as a viewer. You know, we have si- five senses, right? And if you're ignoring the sense of sound, yeah, you're you're asking to fail, right? I, 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 but yeah. in the art of killing. You've got a pretty new, but very prominent name in horror scoring your film. Do you not tell me about him? Well, Paul Wiley, uh, some may know him from the guitarist, you know, in Marilyn Manson. He's also scored Terrifier 1 and 2 and will be scoring Terrifier 3 coming up. And Stream. And uh, from the same production company, Fuzz on Lens, uh, uh, the Stream film. He's doing those. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's amazing, dude. He's 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 my favorite composer, uh, absolutely. And uh, it's just it's an absolute dream come true to work with him. I, it was I, really strange how we got hooked up with him too. Yeah, um, tell me about that. Yeah, yeah. On. We were, you know, of course, running our Indiegogo campaign at the time, and all of a sudden, you know, months later, months after the Kickstarter ended, because we did a Kickstarter first and then did an Indiegogo. After the Kickstarter ended. I guess it was about a few months later, we get a message on there. Hey, I'd love to, you know, try to score your film for you. And I looked at it and his name was Paul Wiley. You know, it was Paul Wiley Music. And um, I was like, Jacob, do you know him? But at the time, you know, I, I wasn't big into Terrifier and I didn't know who he was, but Jacob did. And he's like, hey, you know, we need to contact him. So we reached out to him and that's. No, he's, I was like, you're fucking lying. You, <laughs> Like, like, you're a lying like, piece of shit man right because well, this was when we were shooting like a block two like our biggest block of, of the film you know and, like we're working 14 hour days and it's 125 fucking degrees and like dude you're dude like i'm too tired man don't even be fucking with me right now you know I was like no he's for real i check out the email i was like paul was like you know i, I checked out your campaign like i absolutely love this concept the poster the, te- the teaser little trailer we had for it back then he's like I would love to work on it, you know, like um, ended up talking to him, having about an hour meeting. We like hit it off really well. And within like, you know, a half hour or so we were rocking. We had the contract signed and we were on our way, man. It was just still can't believe it, honestly. You yeah. Because and every time we deliver him a scene, we have the, the track back in just a couple days. Was, yeah. It moves well, very you know, fast. Yeah. Had I not just heard the little the little piece of it from the trailer. I wouldn't have believed your ass either. Yeah. <laughs> wait till that's, you hear that's great story, though. Man. Wait till you hear that. I, I can't wait, all. man, because if yeah. if I'm being honest about it, um, you know, I'm gonna go out on a very thin limb here, and I'm gaining weight, so I can't walk too far out there. <laughs> but I feel like if I had to choose between John Carpenter's music and John Carpenter's films. I would take John Carpenter's music. Oh, well, yeah. If one of them has to go, the movies have to go yeah. because the the music can't go anywhere. Absolutely, yeah, me too. I caught. I get, I get mad vibes of John Carpenter from what I just heard. Oh man, in, it's, in it's this, throughout. there's many like elements that you'll hear. Like I was like, dude, that's like straight up fog shit right there. You know, the fog and like Halloween. Christine, like, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, and like, it's like you can tell obviously too that you know. I, you know, we told him, you know, kind of the sound, like, you know, I wanted and things like that. But you can tell, like, it's very, he's very influenced by Carpenter, no doubt, you know. I'm very I mean, detailed with everything. Oh, yeah. Like, if there's something happening within the scene, he makes sure the sound is just like, like, like the fan, for instance, in the uh, in the trailer. Sure. Um, you, you'll see it, hear it spinning, and the music matches the spin. I mean, it's just little tiny yeah, things i mean the sounds that he can create with the sound like i mean yeah. and he's stacked with all this old you know vintage equipment and stuff like the real deal man like like it's it's amazing 
Oh, look who's showing up. Dixie. Dixie. Dixie right, yeah, on Dixie. my just... mind. And uh yeah, and speaking of that, we also have in the soundtrack, we have a few tracks from his band Razor Candy too. Razor Candy. Okay, putting that on the list. I didn't know Razor yeah. Candy. Check I'm it out. A, really yeah, good. I, I'm an ACDC kind of guy, you know, so I got to catch up with the times a little bit. <laughs> just, just a little bit. Well, let's talk about some of your cast here, guys. Actually, let me go back to one thought about sound and why I think it is important that you have such a, a home run hitter in Paul Wiley in this film. So... I recently saw the film uh, Megan, the one about the little AI yeah. robot, you know, um, I was, I'm not a naysayer of this film. Okay. I'm just saying it's not, you know, it's not a grand slam type of flick, but right. it's a solid double, solid double. You know, you can live on a double. <laughs> if right. I hit doubles all the time, I'd be an all-star. This is an all-star <laughs> flick, but it was largely just a pretty good film until this little moment when our little robot you know gets her shit in gear and she, i think she picks up her little i think it was maybe a sword or something and she's walking through this hallway and the music hits and it's very to me it felt like a carpenter type little oh yeah little, yeah. little jingle you know and she's walking in step with the beat and i'm like oh shit okay i perked up okay that's why you don't fuck around and forget about that you know that fifth sense you know the, the the sense of hearing so i think you guys have done a great thing here guys and um yeah. yes sir i would like to talk about the cast a little bit all right so i want to talk first about the people that i'm familiar with because there are a few people in this that i am familiar with others i'm going to need you to tell me about all turn right. me on to them you know what i'm saying yeah so first of all jason crow he was in don't fuck in the woods too satanic soccer mom from ohio which i don't know how i missed that with a title like that it's got to be a banger he was in they see you also in thrust he knows mr buzzkill all of this in uh 2022 so yeah, he's been a he busy was, guy yeah he was also in our previous films uh red river which is now called hillbilly bloodbath and um kill granny kill he was in yeah. both of those yep See, both of those are on my list. Yeah. Um, you know, and he hasn't been in all starring roles, but he's been super busy nonetheless. Yeah, so, like, yeah. tell me about the decision to go with Jason Crow as your uh, as the face of this film. Yeah, Jason was easy, I and mean, we wrote the character around him. We know he, who he is, and we know what he could do. We worked him individually, him so it was written for him. Yeah, yeah it was. Yeah, so. um, yeah, I mean, we've known it for so long, we know what fits him, and this. Mm. was knock out of the park he he took the character even made it better than what we could have even expected oh most definitely yeah he's he's been absolutely phenomenal jason has like phenomenal range man there's really i don't think anything much that he can't do man and he's like totally into it he's uh we always like every we always said like you know every movie we do we got to get crow in there you know there's and I think that's I will definitely do that because I mean he's just a pleasure to work with. He he's is true, he's a true professional. He's always there to help out. You know he shows up on mm -hmm. time. Just everything, anything you need, he's right there. So if if you're Tarantino, he's your Sam Jackson. Absolutely, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, let's see what Dixie's got to say. He's a top notch character actor for sure. Any level you need. See, mm -hmm. I mean, just kudos all around. Thank you very much, Dixie, for chiming in there. Dixie's a He's badass. A, Jason Crow is a you know an, an indie film legend for sure. Yeah. So I want to talk about some of the people that are I, I would consider in my circle, and and I say that they, they may not even name me in their circle, but I'm going to name them in mine. The, the people that I know. First off, um, Jessa Flux. Uh, you know, people that you know listen to this podcast would know her from Deadly Dealings. The upcoming Scream Dream, uh, the upcoming Murder Size that I can't wait for. Um, let me just tell you, at Slasher Sports, we love Jessa Flux. So tell me about your experience working with Jessa. Uh, Jessa's awesome, man. Like uh, We had uh, contacted her right when we started doing the original campaign video. And, you know, I'd seen a lot of some stuff, you know, I think maybe the first thing I would learned about her through like some uh, donald farmer film don farmer films there and um 
through that, you know, I, I thought she, you know, done some really good work. And so I just contacted her through that, you know, through knowing those films and things like that and reached out to her. I think even Jason, I think Crow might have, you know, originally, like, I was like, how? He brought it to, brought it to our attention. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He's like, uh, so I, you know, I was checked out some more of her work and everything. And she was, she's great. We loved working with her. Any potential people that could come up working with, uh, Jessa Flux, if if you think she's only a pretty face, then shame on you because you're missing out on a talented mind. She's got a lot of really good ideas, a lot of really good ideas. Absolutely. Now, let me bring up somebody and close your ears, Dixie. I'm not going to sweet talk you while you're listening <laughs> in. But I know of Dixie through uh, Curse of the Wear Deer. Good friend of mine, uh, Ben Johnson, directed this film. It was still in post-production. Uh, then in Deadly Dealings. Um, quite fond of Dixie, and uh, you've got her in the art of killing. Oh man, Dixie's another one that has like is there for like anything you need, man. I'm serious, she's like so incredibly talented, like not only in acting but like set design. And like, I've never met anyone that like you, you just describe the character, and then like, bam, you know, like the next day she has this whole character laid out, you know. She has the wig, she has the cost of the wardrobe, she has all the like little accessories and things for it and stuff that just really brings the character to life, man. Even brought the, the dialogue because you had to have that southern draw. Yeah, southern She's draw. She's from, you know, northern, I think northern Ohio, if I remember correctly. But uh, she really brings it out, and we were able to to work with her and she got her Southern draw going and it was oh, perfect. Right. We had a lot of, yeah. uh, you know, several pre-production meetings and things like that and try to get the draw <laughs> down because it was, it was a little initially tough to get, get you know, remove that. So, um, yeah, but she was like totally a trooper, man. And like we had several meetings and. Oh, yeah. Tennessee, my bad. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Damn you very good. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, like we we love Dixie, man. She's amazing, absolutely amazing. We'd work with her anytime. So uh, you see my my sister chiming in there with Curse of the Wear Deer. Um, there was uh, I, I guess I should tell a story here um, before we move on to our next person. But um, you know we're we're just past Christmas and uh, we had our family get together, and one of my family members, uh, in lieu of a gift for our uh, secret Santa situation. Um, he said, donate to a charity in my name and, you know, just, I guess, make it the minimum, uh, gift, uh, amount. So my son drew his name and my son donated to the film curse of the wear deer for, uh, post-production, <laughs> uh, costs, you know, and made a little certificate for him. And, um, I, I guess while the, while some of the people were still there, I held off. But when, you know, certain people in the family who might not have appreciated the trailer, um, you know, when, when they head out, headed out for the day, I went ahead and showed the trailer to my family. And I guess it's one of those just kind of stuck with everybody. Like, I mean, why not, you know, cheer on? Uh, I, I guess it was Reeves Elliott as he got his penis impaled by deer antlers <laughs> and it's just like hanging there on the end of the, the antlers and it's just <laughs> jiggling and Oh God, I don't know why I showed my mother that clip, but <laughs> I did. All right. So I, so I was gracefully uh, offered the chance to, to screen a film from a good friend, Adam Freeman, uh, another Kentucky gentleman. Um, and I've mentioned it already, was Deadly Dealings. Mm -hmm. uh, fun little story of love, loss, and sexy lighting. And it starred uh, Ronnie Jonah. I knew very little about Ronnie uh, you know, at the time, um, but she was an impressive specimen. And you know, I, I learned that she was involved in you know, another one of my loves, professional wrestling, and actually wrestled in the territory that was at one time the developmental territory for WWE. What you see in Ronnie is, you know, more than meets the eye. So what did you see in Ronnie that said she fits this project? She's another one that we've worked with for years. Um, we worked with her on both of our other projects. Yeah, going back all the yeah. way to uh, Hillbilly Bloodbath, you know, a.k.a. Or Red River. Um Cause we had, uh, Jason played hamburger head in that one, like the creature and stuff. And, uh, 
they were dating at the time, so they were always together and stuff. So, you know, we, uh, she'd come in on set and stuff like that. She was doing a lot of, uh, spe- you know, special effects and stuff like that at the time. So she was helping uh, Sven uh, Granlin with who did all of her effects for that film. She come in, was helping him. So she was not only doing effects, she was like uh, jumping in and doing like playing little bit parts and we put her in a body pit or, you know, whatever we needed to do at the time. You know, she, she was there to do whatever we needed. Yeah, she played and a cop and carry and kill. Right. Yeah. That goes like, and the same thing, like, like saying Ronnie's always game to do whatever. It's like, you know, when you make movies, like shit always happens and, people are going to call you the night before and drop out. Like, you know, like when you're doing this kind of on this level, it, it always happens. And Ronnie's one of the people like, it's like, Hey, you know, so-and-so called and canceled. Uh, you might play in a cop today or whatever. And so she ended up playing a, you know, uh, uh, a cop in uh, kill granny kill because somebody dropped out. And that's, so she's cool. She, and she played a body. She was a body wrapped up in plastic in the corner. You know, it's like, so, She's there for whatever you need, man. It's a good way to catch a nap while you're filming. <laughs> right. And you have Erica Dyer, um, a fan of Erica. I want to shout out She's her awesome. podcast. Yeah, Incoherent Ramblings of a Crazy Bitch. Right. I don't, it's a misnomer, okay? Erica's not a, a crazy bitch. No. That, no. That, that you know of. The uh, best scream I've ever heard. Oh, dude. Easily. <laughs> Like, Legit. You know that scream you hear in all those movies, you know, going back from like 50 years. I forgot what it's called right now. But like they need to remove that fucking thing and like just drop her scream in there and just let everybody use it. Like it's the best scream I've ever heard in my entire life. Hands down. You're talking about the Wilhelm scream? Yeah. They need to just dump that motherfucker out and put hers in there. <laughs> so we need the dire scream. Okay. Yes. It, the name fits too. So it does. yeah. It sounds great. Let's just go ahead and introduce that shit, man. Archive it and be, you know, let's do it. <laughs> Done Here's deal. Work with. <laughs> Ellie Parker, who had a pretty good role in a very popular film, a very recent film, Bones and All. Um, she was in this film. The rest of this cast have not had the pleasure. So I, I guess just tell me about the process of casting the guys that maybe the main players that I've not mentioned that maybe yeah. I d- Yeah, another one. Uh, Take it away. Kentucky, he's, he is absolutely phenomenal is uh, Deaton Gabbard. He's been in a lot of other films too. I think he was even working on one in Utah. Multi talented. Yeah, multi talented. Um, he's also going to do some of our uh, digital effects. Mm-hmm. Um, but he he just brought the role because he's you know playing this jock, this uh, high school jock that's you know recently out of high school, and you know he's just trying to mess stuff up because he follows this other guy, um, which is um, Connor mm-hmm. Holden. Um, he's actually from New Jersey, and I mean, he he was able to take the character of Roger and just mold him to his own, and he really brought a lot out of that character. And I th- as you'll see, he's he's going to be a scene stiller for sure. Him and Deaton. Yeah, his wardrobe was still the scene alone, man. Like I was like, dude, we need some jorts and shit. Like so, like the next, I tell him like, you know what the wardrobe is. Like the next day, dude, he has like jorts. So I'm telling you, like. The jorts were like, you know, the pocket shit's like hanging out of them, you know, like <laughs> like the bag might be sleeping out a little bit kind of thing. <laughs> just absolutely. And he was this hilarious guy. I mean, he's like so professional and like uh, he, you want know, to check him out, too, because he does like he's doing like some cartoons. He's a really good animator and stuff, dude. He's like super cool, dude. Yeah. And then we got um, Casey. Um, Casey. Uh, what's her last name now? It was Robinson. Uh I guess it's Barnett now because right. she got married to Matt. Um, but she, you know, she brought a lot. She's done a few films. I don't think she's quite up there just yet. I know she's working a lot now. Mm-hmm. But, uh, and then her husband, uh, Matt Barnett, he uh, brings a lot to the character of Travis. Yeah, Matt's awesome. uh, of course, our lead, um, one of our lead uh, females is Kayla Perkins, yeah, Kayla. who's done numerous films. And we've worked with her since she was 12 years old. So we've got to see her grow in each role that she does. Um, yeah, I've worked on everything with her from like commercial, because I do like work at ad agency and stuff too. Like as far as like commercial production, the like mini music video, she was in a code music video that we shot. Um, Wicked World, if you want to check that out from code, it's a pretty cool video. And uh, yeah, we worked with her for a long time. And it's like, um, yeah, so I guess maybe she was like, 13 was say 13 or something yeah. so like many 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 years 
And we always, we never, she's been in our other films and stuff. It was like, we got to have like Kayla in a lead capacity. So she, you know, we got the chance to work with her as, a, as one of the leads in, in this film. She was absolutely amazing. Really, really great. Yeah. And then we had a newcomer, uh, Rayanne Hufflin Walker. Mm -hmm. um, she brought a lot to the star character. Um, kind of gothic look so we have a nice balance you know yeah. of like veterans and like up and comers and things so it was a really um, amazing cast to work with you know i see that a lot in the films that i that i cover um i don't even want to say i cover um that puts too much credit on my end um but the, the films that i get to learn about from the likes of you and my previous guests that there is a large I guess balance of veteran to barely, you know, feet wet type actors and, and really behind the scenes as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important because mm -hmm. I've always said the black belt needs the brown belt as much as the brown belt needs the black belt because the mm -hmm. black belt has to pass this on to somebody and, you know, use the, you know the expertise that they've gotten over the years and and mold the people underneath them and then the you know the brown belt needs that black belt to learn from to to one day be that black belt so the veterans very much need the young folks on scene or on on set as much as you know the vice versa is true and that's just my unprofessional unsolicited opinion but you i think you on. have yeah, I think you have a great mixture going on here. And, you know, making a film is is not cost free. Uh, you know, so what kind of funding campaign do you have going on right now? Yeah, we're actually in demand now um, with our Indiegogo. Um, last to check is about 6500 is what we're up to. Um, we ran a Kickstarter that we raised 11000 and then a finishing funds campaign, which is on demand now, which is what we have going now with that and do you have like some uh some, some fun perks to uh to throw out there to the to the public absolutely especially the a lot of people seem to enjoy the associate producer credit mm -hmm. we have that um we have the nice shot which is where somebody can submit their photo and uh we'll use it in the film which is going to end like yeah within like i don't know a week or two so that one's very very limited and going out, but uh, yeah. people like have really enjoyed that. And we've had some super creative ways to actually get them in the film. So yeah, uh, Kellen Durai, I'm sure you may have heard of him, but uh, he's one that came on as uh, us killing him on screen, and uh, he brought a lot to that character too, which is oh yeah, like Thomas know, Townsend. Choose your own death uh, perks, yeah. you know. Like uh, you know, I've noticed a lot of times, and it's not a knock or anything, but like you're watching these movies you're like okay that's that's where that you know somebody bought a perk right there you know like you can just obviously tell and it kind of sometimes it takes you out of the movie and it's like just thrown in a weird place or whatever but we've sure. been very lucky to be able to, to incorporate these like into scenes and stuff that we you know already had and stuff and and like get them streamlined into it so they actually make sense as why these people you know people were here and stuff so, you know, and, and, and these actors that like came in or like bought these perks have actually made a good scene, you know, that's actually going to benefit the movie too. So, which is really great. Well, yeah. as a filmmaker, especially on the indie scene, uh, you're likely surrounded with a lot of folks who are still wet behind the ears, not a ton of experience and just kind of scratching and fighting for that exposure and maybe a chance to make some money in film one day. Mm -hmm. uh, what advice do you have, whether as a director, actor, screenwriter, what have you, what advice do you have for the person wanting to get started, but doesn't know which steps to take first? Yeah, just get out there. Um, auditioning is the biggest thing, you know, just perfect auditioning. Um, get in with the right people, you know, just go out and help out on set. A lot of times, you know, you're going to see somebody and they're going to be like, hey, can you jump in here? And then they're going to see your range and what you can do during that. So, it, you know, that gives you some exposure to actually come in on a project. Yeah, just get out there and do it. And especially, like, as a filmmaker or writer or whatever, anything, just, like, freaking write, man. You know, like, just sit down and, like, fucking, you know, write something. And then if you're a director, just get out there and shoot something. You know, don't keep making excuses. It's, like, easy to make excuses of why, you know, if I could just wait until I get this next big camera or whatever, you know, like, fuck all that. 
just get you a cheap camera or your iPhone or whatever and just get out there and shoot that shit, you know, shoot the bitch and like that's his that's it. his coin it's like yeah you know let's shoot this bitch yeah before we rose like come on let's shoot this bitch been saying for 20 years kind of call on or whatever but like that's just do it man let's like, just get out there and do it there's really nothing more you can learn with that we get in there with some nice people uh work some various different roles on a film set learn all you can and you're going to meet those people that you're going to you know continue on and maybe mention you if you do a good job on the next project well let's shoot this bitch then yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> let's shoot this bitch all right so what do you guys hope to accomplish with the art of killing i'm um, definitely just to get it seen um we're gonna hit a lot of festivals this year with it um we're actually in the middle of uh color correction and stuff now on it um you know heath has been oh yeah gracious enough to Please really help us out <laughs> yeah yeah we need a, a whole segment just for heath but uh he's uh really allowed us to help this movie and grow it because without him, we couldn't have done anything. Um, one of the best line producers I've ever worked with. And like, this is uh, like one of the, the first film he's ever worked on. He had actually watched kill granny kill or uh, one of our other executive producers. Keith was also amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I can't, uh, um, he he's had, also acting in the film and a great actor and plays the director in the movie. He like, he, he gave uh, Heath a copy of the film. He's like, yeah, man, I don't know if you'll really like this, you know, don't watch it around people that might get offended by it, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and like, and he didn't really expect them to like it. And he came back into work the next day. He's like, dude, man, I love this. This is my kind of shit. Like if you're ever doing anything, please let me know. And that's kind of how it happened. And like, he's helped us out so and much. And now his, he even has, we had a small part in him initially for him, but his character grew throughout the film. So he's got an even bigger role right. within it. And he's, oh man, he's just been phenomenal. That's the thing with indie film, man. You might yeah. start out as like a PA and like in the day you're like, you know, you're, you're, you're acting or you're, you know, helping the assistant camera or like whatever. You just never know. Like it's what's so kind of cool in a way though, about doing these kind of like low budget micro films and stuff. You can really get in there and like do multiple things and you just never know on the day on the set like that. Dixie with a shout out to the entire behind the scenes team. All fantastic. Dixie, you're fantastic guys. Listen, I, I've got a, I, I guess a question that, that maybe only you individually can answer. You know, I, I need to preface with again, going back to my hillbilly roots as a pro wrestling fan, you know, growing up, uh, I watched a lot of Memphis wrestling, and we had a uh, a guy over in Knoxville by the name of Doctor Tom Pritchard. He was a uh, it ended up being a, a big time uh, trainer. Probably yeah. will go down in history as a better trainer than wrestler. He was kind of a mid card guy, tag team guy, you know, but very knowledgeable. And at one time, he had uh, the guy that eventually became Stone Cold Steve Austin, who was going as stunning Steve Austin at the time, and a guy whose name was Brian Lee, prime time Brian Lee to be exact. So in those car rides, you know, in order to get the, I guess, the charisma out of the guys, he, he posed a question to these guys and he said, you know, this is probably rhetorical, but just answer it for me. What's so stunning about Steve Austin? What's so prime time about Brian Lee? My question to you guys, filmmakers should have their calling card, okay? I just need to know, what's so Jacob Ennis about Jacob Ennis? Hmm. Let's shoot this bitch. Well, <laughs> it goes back to like, I mean, you know, honestly, I grew up on like drama films and USA Up All Night. That kind of shit. I was always more gravitating. all night. Right. I was always more gravitated like Monster Vision shit. Like I was always gravitated to more like the super low budget shit. Look like it was shot for a few hundred bucks or something. And I'm always about as far as like just have, make a fun movie. You know, just make a fun movie. Um, throw it's blood, boobs, and gore, man. You know, like let the and let the characters breathe. You know, give them room to to really expand. Uh, I think, like, too, like, one of the things that I'm, I'm really proud of, one of the things is uh, the writing, you know? Like, I think their characters are pretty memorable. Uh, locations, like, I think a, a lot of times in independent movies, locations kind of get looked over, too, you know? Like, how many films have you seen with, like, 
someone sitting in an apartment with just like stark white walls or something, you know, like, um, find something like, you know, like you probably have something in your backyard or in your yeah. County or something. That's cool. Like write a scene around that. That's kind of one of the things I always was really proud of is like, if you watch our films and stuff, I believe the write in and like the locations and like that, like the locations are almost like a character in the, in yeah, the you show. couldn't build a set that looks that good. That, that type of thing. So, yeah. Same question to, to to Greg. What's so Gregory Brock about Gregory Brock? Um, my my biggest thing is writing. You know, I I really enjoy writing. I really get into the characters, uh, just setting up a scene, even helping it flow to the next scene. Um, that's the biggest thing is you know my mine along with Jacob's character development, and uh, just being able to go scene to scene, and everything flows like, you know, right off the page. Yeah. Cause we write, you know, we co-write everything together and we just like, I'll write a scene and like throw it off to Greg, but you know, we just keep throwing it back. I've tried to do that with like many people like before and it, like it never works out. So I've never, you know, had been able to find, I'm very lucky to find a co-writer and produce some partner and stuff with Greg. Cause like we were on the same brain yeah. wave and like after a script's done, we don't, it's like, did I write that? Did you write that? Like, yeah. like we can't even really, you know, remember sometimes. It's how seamless it is. They're just finishing each other's sentences and sandwiches. We right? do that a lot. We'll set each other up, you know, too, to like, you know, like trying to outdoor each other or something, or, you know, try to outdo each other from the, you know, one scene to the next or something. So it's fun. Before we slide into the gag reels, fellas, uh, do you want to tell everybody where they can find you on your socials uh, or maybe even find your, your film to be supported? Yeah. Um, we have the Indiegogo. Um, which you can go to the Art of Killing Facebook page and you can see the link there. Um, you can find me on uh, social media, uh, Gregory W. Brock on Facebook. Um, I don't use Instagram, or which we do have an Instagram page for the Art of Killing. Um, and then I don't use Twitter much. Well, personally, I, you know, just Jacob Bennis, filmmaker on Facebook. Uh, it's usually about really all I really do. I don't do a ton of social media stuff like that. Um, but yeah, you can look me up there and all of our films are released through camp motion pictures, which is uh, alternative cinema.com. And you can find it all, all of our films there. Like I said, everything's all the contracts ran out. So everything's like getting renegotiated. So you should see more things going on the streaming soon, like uh, Tubi and some of our things are also getting released on, back on Amazon and stuff. So yeah, you should definitely see everything streaming back up. Soon. And I also want to give a shout out to Kay Brock, everything extraordinaire too. <laughs> right. <laughs> she, she's literally done everything on set and she just, that's she's, Greg's wife. And yeah. like, she's bailed us out a million times. She's oh, like, he's got to say that then if he wants to eat. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, she's been I great. love it guys. I absolutely love it. And that is going to do it for this week on Slasher Sports Cinema. Go and support this film. Find the Indiegogo. Throw a few bucks their way. That This is not going to be uh, ill-spent money. Take care of our filmmakers. Take care of horror filmmakers, most importantly, you know, from, from my point of view. And as always, may you all go forth and drink the blood of your enemies from the skulls of their children. Thanks a lot. <laughs>